Welcome to the uh, our colloquium for spring of 2010. Before I introduce today's speaker, I would like uh, I would like to talk a little bit about a very important matter. By the way, my name is Narasimhan. I am an emeritus faculty member in the departments of material science and engineering and environmental science policy and management. <coughs> we started this colloquium series in the year 2000, 10 years ago, in the fall of 2000. Since then, we have presented stimulating and educational talks on all aspects of water thoughtfully maintaining a balance between the sciences and the humanities. Today's lecture will be the 80th in this uninterrupted series, most of which has been visually archived, and you can look them up on the web. Water, the remarkable natural phenomenon has inspired the Water Resources Center archives, which is interested in, in, in <coughs> accumulating and disseminating all kinds of information on water, from sciences to the engineering and the, and the humanities. And this was done by the archives to bring together the entire campus and the public with a common goal of water education in, a more, in the most idealized sense. This educational venture has appropriately been supported by the collective financial support from the deans across the campus, the vice chancellor and the provost, the uh, head of the Earth Sciences Division of the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory and the uh, <coughs> Groundwater Resources Association of California. Even as we are grateful to these institutions for supporting this, we note that the moral support that these units have given for this education about water transcends monetary values. Today is also a day of transition. For long, the Water Resources Center archives has been administratively functioning under the Water Resources Center headquartered in UC Riverside. Because of the financial situation across California, this Water Resources Center at Riverside has since been closed down. It was closed in December of 2009. Consequently, there is an uncertainty about the future of Water Resources Center archives. Where is it going to be? Is it going to continue in, at the Berkeley campus? Or is it going to be moved out to some other campus? There is a <coughs> due process has been set in to identify the particular campus where the archives will eventually end up. We all would like to have the archives remain here at Berkeley as it has always been. But we have to wait with patience for due process to take its course. Meanwhile, we have prudently decided to put on hold preparations for further colloquia starting this, this fall. We, haven't, we are not going to plan on any more colloquia until the future of the, uh, the uh, center, the Water Resources Center archives is decided. Accordingly, 
Let us savor the moment today and enjoy today's colloquium both for its own content and for its historical relevance. Now I will ask Linda to say a few words. Thank you, Nari. I just wanted to uh, talk, say a few words about the colloquium and um, that really over the years, over these 10 years, we've had surprisingly few glitches. And when you think about how many speakers we have had here, so I just wanted to recall a few of the things. We, we've never had a speaker not show up, which is amazing. Uh, we did have one speaker, that was Tom Birmingham from Westlands Water District, and he, uh, I believe the day of lecture, he decided to send his deputy. He was involved in water hearings in Sacramento and he couldn't get away. Um, and I know that ETS does a fantastic job videotaping all of, all of the lectures, but we did have a couple of glitches. There was one time when Patrick Wright from CalFed was here and they ran out of tape in the Q&A because the, um, they only brought a uh, one hour tape and the Q&A was really fantastic. And we had another lecture, I can't remember, it was a couple of semesters ago when they started the tape late. So uh, we, they only got the Q&A, which uh, was also uh, kind of a glitch. So that one is not up on the website. Um, we've only had one computer glitch, and that was when, uh, really not a glitch, that was when John Kane was talking about the Delta, and the computer started to go into its update mode, and it wouldn't stop, and so someone from the audience gave us a computer to use. And um, we also did have a lecture scheduled on 9-11 that we canceled, and uh, was, it was given about three weeks later. And we've had about five different rooms. This is our fifth room. And uh, as I've said before, uh, rooms are one of the hardest parts about organizing the, the colloquium series. And um, we've had a fabulous diversity of topics and speakers. And the videos have been viewed over 40,000 times on our website. And um, I think that's it, thank you. Well, we have, we, this colloquium series, believe it or not, it's a labor of love. I mean, we did this just because this is something that needs to be done. And uh, it's been a pleasure, and uh, <clears throat> I'm not surprised that Linda is moved by this whole thing. But that befits the occasion, I suppose. Now, <clears throat> what about today's talk? Today's talk, we have about the Livermore site, and we have Pete McCarrigan, one of our former alumni. <laughs> Not only that, he has been part of our band playing the trombone. So here we go back. <laughs> <laughs> so he's going to, he got his, uh, Bachelor's degree here at Berkeley on <clears throat> in geology, then went on to Wisconsin, got a master's in hydrogeology, and he has ever since that, he has been doing hydrogeological work ever since, sometimes in the U.S. Geological Survey, and mostly at the Livermore site. And the, the Livermore site is a super fun site, and for the past 25 years, they have been doing a lot of work on groundwater contamination and cleanup. And this is a fascinating story. And here we have Pete McCarrigan has kindly come, us, uh, come here today to give us the dope on that. Thank you very much, Pete. Thank you. you are. Thank you. All right, thanks everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, as Nari said, I'm the, the Site 200 program leader. Just a little bit of trivia here. The Livermore site has a couple pseudonyms. It's also known as the main site, um, more recently, uh, 
the original name came back into vogue as Site 200. Just some trivia, Lawrence Berkeley Lab, just up the hill is actually Site 100, so you can take that home with you. So um, just getting into a little brief summary or overview of the outline, I'm just going to go over the, ba the background of the site, the, uh, the hydrogeology and some of the challenges that we faced characterizing the hydrogeology and the distribution of contamination beneath the site. Talk about our remediation approach that has been adopted at the uh, laboratory and the effectiveness of that remediation to date. And just touch briefly on the regulatory process and some of the accomplishments over the last 25 years. And I'll close with a brief summary. Before I get started, some brief definitions. DOE's U.S. Department of Energy, U.S. Depar Department of Energy runs the Livermore site. Um, it also funds the uh, Superfund cleanup of the site. EPA is the United, the United States Environmental Protection Agency. It uh, oversees as the oversight, regulatory oversight of the cleanup. CERCLA is Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, most more commonly known as Superfund. And I've got a URL here for you. The, if you're interested in that, there's a lot of information on the EPA web, website, not just CERCLA policy, but also about the chemicals and other sites that, that, that are overseen. Uh, NPL is the national priority list. This is a list of Superfund sites that, that EBA, EPA regulates. And finally, uh, MCL is a maximum contaminant level. This is the highest concentration, highest level of a contaminant that's allowed in drinking water. So this is, this is typically the standard that you need to clean groundwater up to before you can get site closure. Location of the site. See. Whoops. Sorry. Push the wrong button. I'm trying to get a laser here. Here we go. Uh, site east of uh, the city of Livermore. There's a couple of points of reference here. This is the site uh, outlined in yellow. This is East Avenue. I reference these in late, later site or later slides. So this is East Avenue. It borders uh, along the south of the site. Vasco Road is along the western border. It connects up to Interstate 580, which heads to the west through the Dublin Gap here and into the San Francisco Bay. So we're looking from the east to the west here towards the bay. The site uh, history, it was actually a naval air station back during World War II. Uh, they trained Navy pilots back then. After the war, the laboratory was established in 1952. And a little more than 30 years later, groundwater contamination was discovered in an offsite well. Primary contaminants are volatile organic compounds, more commonly known as VOCs, fuel hydrocarbons, metals, and tritium. The primary VOCs are trichloroethylene, or TCE, perchloroethylene, or PCE, also known as tetrachloroethylene. Just a note on tritium. Tritium is below the MCL or drinking water standard of 20,000 picocuries at all locations since 2004. So there is still tritium in the groundwater beneath the site, but it is below the cleanup standards. So here's some historical photos of, uh, of the site when it was a, a naval air station. You can see, if those of you can see here, has the NAS Livermore signia on the side. And this is an aerial shot of a hangar here and some planes. You can see some biplanes here. They actually used biplanes for some of the early pilot training back then during the war. And it's an interior shot of some of the Navy personnel assembling a plane for use on site. Here's an overhead view of the Naval Air Station. You can see some of the Navy buildings here. Again, this is East Avenue that I described before. Some of the buildings here, and then this is the airfield. And overlaid on that is the site as it is today. So when the contamination was first discovered, the first thing we needed to do was find out how it got there. So we did some record search and um, found lots of source areas. I have a blow up of this slide, so if it's hard to read, we can see it on the next one. But just a few notes on that. Basically, the, the source areas are seen in the red. Um, these are, this is a land, former landfill. This was an unlined taxi strip. Um, and we had salvage yard, and basically they were using solvents and degreasers, those volatile organic compounds I talked about earlier, basically degreasers that were used by the Navy. So a few things we see are that um, the highest concentrations are still seen below these former release sites, and that the plumes emanate out from formerly unlined areas. 
So again, here's just a blow up. You can see, oops, excuse me, you can see uh, this airfield that was, that was shown in that aerial photo in some of the buildings here. So they used solvents and other materials on site in those Back in the 40s, it was pretty common practice to just turn drums upside down, let them drip dry, or have a certain area where you would do degreasing, and you would do it over and over and over in the same location, and things got concentrated, and eventually would get down into the groundwater. An overview of the setting, this is the groundwater basin. Uh, the blue is basically the uh, aquifer materials, and the brown is the upland areas. The lab is shown here with a composite plume and groundwater flow from east to west. A few dots here, these are some private domestic wells. We have, still have a lot of agriculture out there, a lot of vineyards in the Livermore Valley. And downtown, there are municipal supplies wells. Those municipal supplies well, supply wells are how Livermore site got, up, got onto the national priority list, how it became a Superfund site. The concern was that the plume would migrate off-site and get into the drinking water supply. Um, Zone 7 is the water agency in, that, in the Tri-Valley area, and Livermore site is referenced here. So this is just an overview of the groundwater elevation uh, contour map within that, within that basin. Again, you can see that the concern was the groundwater, the contaminants would flow through and into the uh, supply, drinking water supply. Similar, similar region here, aerial view. We see the laboratory. Here's the city of Livermore. It's built up a lot since the 1940s, obviously. Um, this, is, this is a gravel quarry here, also known as a, more recently known as the Chain of Lakes. And then this is the city of Pleasanton, Dublin, and this is Interstate 680 going towards San Ramon. Geology, basically it's a quaternary geology, alluvial fan complex. Um, these are the uplands you saw in the groundwater basin map. And uh, one of the interesting things that we, uh, we got to observe a little over 10 years ago was they were constructing the National Ignition Facility and during the excavation they found uh, the fossil remains of a, a mammoth. So they had a fun little contest in the local schools and uh, one second grade girl was the winner. She came up with Niffy as the nickname of the, uh, the fossils. And you can see some of the archeologists and paleontologists working here. Um, Today, that, that, the fossil remains actually became part of the UC Museum of Paleontology, and they're here on site today. Okay, site hydrogeology. As I mentioned, it's basically alluvial fan complex. It's an it's a intermingled sand, gravel, with, in, a, in a matrix of finer grain clays and silts. Um, one thing I'll be talking about a little bit later is how we took that complex hydrogeology and mapped it into hydrostratigraphic units as a way to better understand how the groundwater system works and how the contaminants flow. Um, just a quick definition here, sedimentary sequences whose permeable layers show evidence of hydraulic connection. And again, I'll get back to this, but that's the important thing. It's not so much a geology perspective, but a hydraulic. We have uh, contaminants in six of the nine H HSU, so there's a vertical component to the contamination. And the, as I mentioned, the gradient is east to west. And depth of water is about 40 to 120 feet below ground surface. So back in 1989, this is before any groundwater remediation began, before we began any pumping, this was the water table or the poten potentiometric surface beneath the site. And you can see it was a little steeper, it's a little steeper in the east and it flattens out as it goes off site. In the past 25 years, we've drilled more than 600 wells to monitor the groundwater and also drilled more than 1,200 boreholes. Now, that may seem like a lot, but this is more than a square mile round. We have uh, six HSUs that I mentioned are contaminated. So once you take the, air, the horizontal and the vertical aspect of that, you can understand that that's not actually that big of a number. If you think about a corner gas station, which maybe would fit in about here, that usually has about 10 wells and typically doesn't have the same component, vertical component, maybe one or two HSUs. So a lot of people balk at this number, but it's actually uh, a reasonable number given the complexity of the site and the amount of contamination. So here are just some slides of, of some field activities. Um, this is a drill rig here where we'll drill boreholes or, or monitoring wells or extraction wells, and here are some uh, field technicians installing a pump and doing some maintenance. Just some facts there. So not only 600 monitor wells, we have 153 extraction wells, and we actually do some groundwater injection as well. 
All right, so here's an early cross-section of the site. So back in the 80s, when we were trying to figure out what the hydrogeology was and where the contamination was, we, we drilled boreholes, collected soil samples, characterized those, and drew cross-sections. Cross so this depicts these permeable lenses within a finer grain matrix, and then the, that, those are the shadows, or basically the open lenses here, and then the red is the contamination. The stars are soil samples that were collected and submitted for chemical analysis, and it came back. So where you see it's white, there was no non-detect, and red, we had contamination. So our charter at that point was to try to figure out what was going on, but in this realization, you can see that the lithology is very complex. So our challenge was, trying to predict the, per, the preferred pathways. Where do we think the groundwater was flowing? Where, more importantly, where do we think the contamination was migrating? And where could we find both horizontally and vertically the impacted groundwater zones? So after struggling with this for a few years, we sort of stepped back and took a simplified approach. We adopted some oil field methodology of packaging groups of sediments into, into layers or hydrostratigraphic units. And we also leveraged emerging and database web browser technology. So this was the 1990s. The internet had yet to be born. It was just starting to come around. But browser technology was coming to the surface. And we found that instead of having in the classical sense back then where you had a database person you would go to and say, this is the date, data I'm interested in. Can you please write me a query? Download the data for me. Send it to me. I'll put it in a plotting package. And later that day, I might get a graph. Tools were developed where you basically set criteria on a web page, hit the submit button, come back, it's automatically pat, uh, plotted. Now that sounds pretty simple these days, but 10 or 15 years ago, that was a huge advance. It basically put the power of the data into the hydrogeologist and in a way they could analyze a lot of data in a short period of time. So identification of HSUs, so they're flow control layers. They allow the organization of data in, that makes sense hydrogeologically. Uh, they facilitate the mapping of plumes and successful placement of our wells, and also the construction of uh, groundwater, fate, groundwater flow and fate and transport models. So just a definition here. So think of, so what I have a depiction here, there are three HSUs, A, B, C, this is just a cartoon, and we have the water table or potentiometric surface in those HSUs. So I have drawn three or four wells here that penetrate the water bearing zones within those HSUs. So, and in HSUC, we've, we've depicted some pumping, which draws, the water will draw down in the well as the water is evacuated from the well. And what we're trying to show here is that you'll see response in the pumping well in HSUC, but no response or depression in HSUs A and B. And so that was one of the pieces of information we used to say that flow is, more, is preferentially horizontal here or communicates with in here, but not vertically upward. And that helped us a lot being able to characterize and move forward. Another example of that are here some bore, boreholes in what we call the detail studied area where we, where we drilled several boreholes and wells. So fairly complicated. The pink is the, the more permeable, the, the blue is the finer grain, and, um, and these are the well screens depicted here. So in the hydraulic testing, I have two HSUs in red and blue. These red wells were pumped, and we saw the corresponding drawdown, but the water levels in the blue wells did not respond. Later, the blue wells were pumped, and we not saw no response in the red wells. We also saw that, that these, this definition or separation of the wells within the HSUs was supported by chemistry data. We have, um, as I mentioned before, when we, when we drill boreholes, we collect core, and we submit samples for analysis. So we see this slide here depicts the high concentrations that were detected in these sediments in HSU-1b, but once you got into HSU-2, you had non-detect or very low concentrations. So there was, appears there was some sort of barrier here. This is that former slide where we simply draw that HSU-2, HSU-1b boundary, and now you can see this complex cross-section has come a lot, become a lot simpler. We can now package or group the wells in HSU-1b and group the wells in HSU-2 and move forward in analysis. So some cool graphics here, I hope. So there's the site. Oh, let me back up here a little bit. Um, 
This is the site. This is East Avenue. This is Vasco Road, near State 580, east, west, north. These are scattered data. These are XYZ points in space. And these are basically the contacts between HSU. So our hydrogeologists and geophysicists sat down, went through the borehole lithology, went through the geophysics, went through the chemistry, went through hydraulic data, and determined where within a borehole the contact would be between one HSU and the other. And so the color coding here depicts those contacts in space. These are the same boreholes. Now you'll see they look a little bit more like a borehole. There's a line here. And that's the same data, but now we filled in the thickness of the HSU with the color coding. So it's starting to come together a little bit. Might be a little bit hard to see, but this is the basin of the boundary, the, wa the, the water basin boundary. And then these are the HSUs building up. So we have HSU 5 here at the bottom, HSU 4. And another thing to note, if you remember, this is where the site was. You'll see that HSU 4 pinches out here or no longer exists as you move east. Same thing with 3A, I'm sorry, 3B, 3A. HSU 2 is probably our most continuous HSU beneath the site. HSU 1B and 1A, and then the site again. So as you can see, if you think from a groundwater model construction, the, the, the creation of these HSUs really is helpful in being able to build a 2D or a 3D model. Again, this last one is just a transparency of those HSUs and the underlying data that was used to build it. Okay, so again, back to a cross section. So ignore the colors for a minute and think about just trying to understand how groundwater contaminants would flow here. Fairly difficult. But below this line, we have the, sat the, the water table. These are saturated sediments. And we've, group we've color coded this into HSUs. Now you can see, well, I can look at this as a zone. I can look at this as a zone. And it really helped us. It was a huge leap forward in the characterization and, and, and future remediation of the site. Again, I have a fence diagram or a 3D diagram here. This is. Pre-HSU, I just have channels and lenses and concentration, and it's vertically integrated, and here's my plume, and, and I'm not sure what to do. By splitting that into, by mapping that into HSUs, I now have this contaminated zone that's separated from this. And I know that in this area, I only need to target here. I don't need to go deeper. And I know that this will, this will affect groundwater horizontally. So it really gives you a framework. Similar, similar cartoon here of, a, of an integrated plume mapping down into a 3D, the, the cross-sectional view. Okay, so as I mentioned before, the contaminants are distri distributed both horizontally and vertically. All right, so another set of graphics here. So in this one, I have my HSUs, which we showed before, and then in this, we've mapped in the groundwater plumes. So this is HSU 5 mostly in the east, so if you remember back to that source area map where we had the landfills and the taxi strips, our source areas, you'll see there, there are the, the mostly seen here. Again, the pinching out of the HSUs, HSUs four and three don't necessarily exist here. So we have vertical migration in the source area and then horizontal migration in the, uh, in the east-west direction. HSU four, we had another plume. HSU 3B, so you can see these are stacking on each other in beneath the source area. As we get into HSU 2, we see a larger plume. And I said I mentioned this is our most, most continuous HSU, so this is actually the largest plume we see on site. And HSU 1B, and there's the site. So you can see portions of the plume have migrated off site here. And there's my HSU structure model again. So once again, the plumes mapped out in HSU and color coded. It's a little easier to see that one than the previous graphic. Okay, so now we have a better idea of the groundwater system, the hydrogeology, how it's working, how groundwater is flowing, and where the contaminants are. What do we do now? How do we clean up the site? Well, part of the uh, Superfund circle process is working with the regulators and the community to determine the approach to clean up the site. So the priori priorities were set as cleaning up the western plume, the off-site plume, 
the southern plume, basically the portions of the plume that have migrated off-site. Once that was complete, moving inward and moving, uh, cleaning up the distal portions or the areas away from the source areas. And then finally, doing source area control to try to prevent further leaching and migration out of the source areas. Here's a potentiometric surface map. So I showed you the map before, the contour map before pre-remediation. It was a fairly even uh, set of contours across the site. In this, you can see where we have pumping wells and then the drawdown that I depicted in that HSU cross-section. And what we've drawn here in blue are the capture zones. So these, for example, this extraction well here will capture all the water within this area. It'll eventually flow into there and be captured. To date, we've built 37 facilities at site. Again, seems like a lot, but it's a fairly big and complex site. And we have a variety of these facilities. Initially, what we built were fixed facilities. So it was a dedicated building capable of treating a large volume of groundwater and then extensive pipelines out to wells. Well, what we found after building four of those, that was a very expensive way to go. So what we moved towards were smaller portable units. So this is fairly simple. This is just a transportainer and an air stripper inside here. And a smaller set of wells could be hooked up to this. But the concept was, is as groundwater was cleaned up in the area that this facility was located, it could be picked up and moved to another area of the site. Whereas in the fixed facility, it is there forever. We also have GTUs. G stands for granular activated carbon. This fairly simple process where you're just pumping the groundwater through the carbon, the VOC absorb onto the carbon, and you discharge the clean, treated water. MTU is a smaller version of an air stripper. I should mention what an air stripper is. Basically, you pump the groundwater into a tank, you bubble water through the tank. The volatile organics, they want to volatilize. They want to be in the vapor phase. So you're bubbling water through, bubbling air through the water to get the contaminants into the vapor phase, and then that vapor phase is sent through a, a carbon vessel. A STU is a solar treatment unit. This is just basically a mini version of the GTU. And then we also have vapor extraction systems. So, like I said, I mentioned before about the priorities. We, our first priority was to control the off-site plumes, make sure that contamination was not moving any further off-site, and then move inward. Once we'd done that, we started attacking the sources. So the soil vapor extraction systems are very effective, much more than groundwater. As I mentioned, the, the, the compounds want to be in the vapor phase. So in this case, you're, you're still drilling a well just like you would in groundwater, but that well is screened above the water table. And you apply a vacuum to the well, you pull the va soil vapors out of the subsurface in through an aqueous phase carbon. Um, this is a very effective way of removing the VOC mass from the subsurface. And finally, we have a catalytic reductive dehalogenation unit, or CRD. And we have two of these on site, and these are areas where we still have tritium on site. Now, although tritium is below the drinking water standard, our agreement with the community is that we would not discharge tritiated groundwater to surface. So this is a, a closed loop system where we're extracting, extracting groundwater from the subsurface, running through this dehalogenation unit, which basically uses um, platinum as a catalyst, strips the chlorine mo molecules off, the groundwater is re-injected into the subsurface. So basically we're taking the VOCs out and putting the tritium back in. And this is just a slide showing the uh, different applications of those units. So a solar unit can, can uh, treat a, a range of um, concentrations, but a fairly low volume. A GTU can do both high concentrations and large volume. MTU is a subset of a PTU. These are our air strippers. So the, basically, the PTU can do the higher concentrations, but um, uh, as opposed to GTU, cannot do as high, as, treat as high a concentration. All right, so how much groundwater are we removing? Well, we basically treat 70,000 gallons of groundwater a day. The majority of that is discharged to the ground surface. You'll see there's a Retention basin here, this is basically a storm retention basin. Many of the facilities here discharge the surface, drain. Uh, that treated groundwater drains to the, to the retention basin, which then will migrate off-site into a Royal Las Positas in that, and, and uh, travels off-site. We also have, in this portion of the site, treatment facility A, 
a royal seco cuts through the site here and that treated groundwater is discharged there. To date, we've treated more than 3.8 billion gallons of groundwater. Now, the cleanup standards are in the parts per billion. So if you think of one part per billion, that's one molecule in a billion gallons of groundwater, roughly. All right, so here's just a snap, couple slides showing the uh, effectiveness so far. So this was 1992. We had HSU-1B. We have the VOC plume extending off-site. And 14 years later, it's nearly cleaned up. HSU-2, again, plume off-site. And the higher concentrations have now been reduced. HSU-5, this is where the, the uh, plume extends off-site to the south in 92 and in 2006. So our primary or initial priority was to stop contamination off-site and clean it up. And we've done a fairly, in my opinion, a good job at that. All right, now let's see if I can get this movie to work. No, let's try it this way. Okay, so you'll see the time. I can run th through this again, just to give you orientation here. This is, oops, wrong button, sorry, apologize. Let me do it this way. This is your time, so these are in quarters. PCE concentrations, HSU-1B, this is the site boundary here. Okay, and these are the range and concentrations. And you'll notice these little red diamonds will pop up and off. That's op operating extraction wells. So that's just an animation of, that's based on data. Now one interesting thing about the way this data is constructed is in on the next slide, 1987, we didn't have as, as many wells as we do in 2010. So how do you construct contour maps that are consistent over time to make a movie like that? Well, a lot of it is using more recent data and projecting it backwards. Otherwise, you get these huge variations in your plume because you'll have extrapolation errors. So we have a whole an entire process where we use groundwater chemistry data, soil data, lithology data, to try to constrain the extrapolation of these uh, interpolations. So here's HSU-2, which is below HSU-1B. You can see the wells are coming on. This is the off-site pipeline. And we're now off-site. We're below 25 parts per billion. To date, we removed approximately 2,800 kilograms of VOC mass from the subsurface. In the beginning, we <coughs> just had a few facilities. These are the fixed facilities, mostly TFA in the southwest corner where the plume emanates off site. The blue is mass removed from groundwater by our groundwater treatment units. And the, the yellowish bars here are mass removed from soil vapor. So you can see as we build our groundwater extraction systems and we added a lot of our portable units and smaller units and moved eastward to the interior site where concentrations were much higher, the mass remove rate went up. But as expected, over time, they decline. And then, so as concentrations decrease, you're removing less mass per same, per same volume. As I mentioned before, soil vapor extraction, very effective method. Um, Interestingly, through time, the amount of mass removed is nearly half, half groundwater, half soil vapor, 1,400 kilograms each. Okay, so we've controlled our offsite plumes. We've moved inward. We're controlling our onsite distal plumes. We've put in hydraulic containment for the source areas. But how do we clean up the sources? This is really what drives the site cleanup. This is, this is now what this, the source area is a way be, this becomes a century long project, not, not just years or decades. A little depiction here, we have, a, we have a drum, somebody didn't do their job, they knocked it over, spilled VOCs, walked away, it percolates down, 
through the water table impacts several zones. Groundwater flow, the VOCs are transported off-site, okay, and some of them sorb into the finer grain uh, sediments. So we've shown from our, from our groundwater treatment system, we do a fairly good job cleaning up these distal portions, but this, especially the fine grain sediments, it's not as much. If you can't pump the groundwater out, you can't remove the contaminants. So, just some bullets regarding that previous slide. Source areas have contaminants in both the coarse and the fine grain. The distal plumes typically only have it in the coarse grain where the groundwater has allowed the, the contaminants to transport away from the source areas. Source area concentrations are much higher. And we've defined the boundary as an area where the concentrations drop by an order of magnitude. So an approach here, if we have a plume, again, our source area, finer grain and coarser grain in the stippled pattern. There's the finer grain. Capture the down leading, downgrading end, the leading edge. Move inward to control the sources and then target the source areas with alternative technologies. Through our record research and, uh, and subsurface Characterization, we've defined 21 distinct source areas. They have, typically have different hydraulic characteristics, a variable VOC distribution, and variable unsaturated zone influence. These are the source areas mapped down into the HSUs. One thing to note is that each HSU plume has a distinct chemical signature, and that's associated with the sources. The sources, the sources were different, therefore the plumes are different. And these, this is a description sort of a high-level description of those plumes. All right, source area cleanup technologies. This little chart here where we have basically dollars on this side and uh, known effectiveness on this side. So down here would be a proven low-cost uh, uh, technology. Well, <laughs> there's nothing right there. So groundwater extraction is proven, SVE is, is proven, dual extraction is basically where you're pumping both groundwater and soil vapor from the same well and treating the streams. This is ongoing. This is not cheap. This is, it is effective. At, we've, we've seen it's effective in the distal and offsite areas, but it's decades of operation, decades of manpower to, to maintain those facilities. So that it, there is a considerable cost. Some things we're looking at are enhanced SVE. This is perhaps re-injecting the hot air effluent from the vapor systems back to the subsurface and try to set up a, a, a VATO zone or a, or a soil vapor circulation cell and use the heating properties to further volatilize contaminants into the vapor phase. Bioremediation where you use microbes to, uh, to, to break down the VOCs. They basically pull off, dehalogenate the, uh, the, the VOC um, chemicals to ethane which is, which is uh, non-toxic. So you can go from, from a toxic chemical to a non-toxic chemical using microbes. Chemical oxidation is basically making an oxidation environment where, which also destroys is, is uh, VOC destruction. Um, in the case with NAPL, is non-aqueous phase liquid or pure product. Now that's something I didn't mention, but with all the characterization and drilling did, did, we did at the Livermore site, we never found any free phase. We thought we would, but we, we, we haven't. But these are some effective technologies for that. Steam injection, where you basically flood a zone with steam. Again, heat helps to volatilize the contaminants, and then you can extract those. And using electrical resistance heating to, again, heat, perhaps even boil the groundwater and let, it, let the contaminants volatilize. Electric osmosis, we, we did an experiment. It didn't, didn't work for us. Um, Couple things that we're looking at right now, or one, one remaining thing we're looking at right now is mechanical fracturing, where you basically frack the subsurface, try to create more uh, permeability through a physical process. Okay, it wouldn't be a circle of talk if I didn't talk about regulations, so. The circle process is lengthy, as I can see, as you can see, the contamination was really originally discovered in the 1980s went on to the uh, national priority list in 87. 
First phase of radial investigation, which is the characterization feasibility study, which is the you're getting into the engineering component. The record of decision and remedy selection was in 1992. Livermore site was actually the first uh, laboratory within the DOE complex to have a record of decision. Then you get into uh, treatment facility remedial design and construction and into a five-year review plan. So we are right here. So we, so every five years after your record decision, you, you uh, do a review document. So our mo most recent one was 2007. We'll have one in 2012. At some point, we'll get to remediation completion and then close out. And just to mention, the, whole, the entire time we have regulatory oversight. So we have to manage a lot of risks, worker safety, pines and fines and penalties for noncompliance. There may be new problems that emerge unexpected costs, and community perceptions. It is a national laboratory, it is a weapons laboratory, it's a very high profile laboratory. So we work with regu the regulators in the community in a constructive manner to seek the end goal. I talked about regulations, this is just the first slide. We have the federal and we also have state and local drivers. So just some accomplishments over the last 25 years. I mentioned this a little bit. We employed powerful data management analysis tools. We adopted oil field practices to construct HSUs to help us better understand and remediate the subsurface. We're optimizing our treatment systems for cost-effective operations. And now we are into this the phase of evaluating other technologies for our source areas. It's a multiple disciplinary team. We have geologists, chemists, engineers, data managers, computer scientists, stakeholders, managers, and obviously business ops. Just a quick note on our web tools. This is a little web portal we have. This is very handy. These are basically some canned tools that someone can come in, a geologist, hydrogeologist, engineer, chemist, whoever, can come in, click on a link, and get, pull data out of our database. They're available over an internet. Uh, speed and utility has enabled more analysis and more participants to examine and interpret data. The more people look at data, the more ideas develop, the more understanding. It also allows us to answer questions we wouldn't otherwise ask. So you, you, you review data, you learn something, you think about something that you wouldn't normally have come across. So just some snapshots of what we have. We have a GIS, laser, allows us to map our sampling and uh, well data. Again, I mentioned the quick plotting tool we have. We have a real-time facility page. These are our treatment units. This is actually a subset of our treatment units. And these are the flow, groundwater flow or vapor flow, depending on the, the, the unit. And this is the last time the data was reported. This is a, we have a network within the site. So at any time, you can go to this website, find out how the status of a facility, what its flow rates are. You can drill down into these units, look at all the extraction wells, again, see the flow rates, flow rates of existing wells. We have a data collection system where we're recording water level and flow data, so we can pull that and do analysis, hydraulic test analysis, and performance analysis. Here's an online geophysical log. Um, we, we store all of our geophysical and lithologic logs electronically. Some of the uh, some, just a little plug here, something that, that came out. I don't know if those of you involved in, in regulatory sites probably know about GeoTracker. The prototype was actually developed at the laboratory as part of our data management system. Um, it's a GIS, and it was, originally, it was originally put in place by a law for underground storage tanks. It is now expanded from the fuel tanks to Department of Defense sites, slick lists, which are typically solvents, and landfill sites. So in summary, Contamination was discovered in 1983, came from the Navy and some of the early lab operations. Primary VOCs are TCE and PCE. We constructed 37 facilities and a variety of extraction wells. And since operations, we've treated 3.8 3 billion gallons of groundwater and 370 million cubic feet of vapor 
which equates to 2,800 kilograms or over 6,000 pounds of VOCs. So that's where we are today. Our challenge now is, as I mentioned, the source areas. We're really excited about that. Maybe I can come back in a few years and we can tell you how we, we're doing there. Um, that's the really exciting part of the science that we're getting into. So I'm glad to be here today. Appreciate the turnout. I know you guys have finals, or at least some of you do. So I appreciate the time. And that's it. As usual, we have plenty of time for questions and comments. Please go ahead. Uh, please wait for the mic before you ask your question so we can get your question on tape. Wow, thanks. Um, <laughs> I, I think if I got it right, it was five parts per billion was the cleanup gold MCL for PCE. That's correct. Is it the same for TCE as yes. well? Yes. And you're still dealing with NAPLE level concentrations in the source areas? We have PPM level in the source areas, yeah. So yeah. Um, uh, several years ago, the US EPA put out a study um, kind of quantifying what they predicted cleanup costs, the uh, investment that the United States is making into restoration of groundwater resources nationwide, estimated some, I think it was 17 to 18 billion dollars per year going into cleanups such as this. This is only you know, one of however many hundreds there are out there. Um, over the next several decades, we're looking at hundreds of billions of dollars going into cleanup efforts like this. And um, you know, as a hydrogeologist, I think it, it would be kind of self-serving for me to cheer it on. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I have, I, 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 I look at this and I kind of wonder, are we really doing the right thing trying to restore groundwater beneath a, a, a weapons laboratory? And you know, the primary objective is to protect the supply wells for the city of Livermore. Mm -hmm. um, are there other ways to approach the problem aside from uh, restoration of an aquifer uh, that could achieve our primary objective of protecting the city's supply? Um, are there ideas that have been floated out there in the scientific community, um, whether it's, uh, we, we saw at the Lodi, city of Lodi, they were looking at doing uh, kind of a combination of using the groundwater extraction and the uh, containment that was being achieved with the remedial efforts to kind of dovetail together with the city's supplies. Um, are there ideas like that from the scientific community that could really, you know, instead of pumping out 3.8 billion gallons of water and spending all of that energy to pump it out and, and, and all of that water, I mean, that, if you think about you know, whatever it costs per liter of water, that's a mm -hmm. huge expenditure. Oh yeah, that's very expensive. Is, is there, are there other ideas as to how we could be, um, you know, uh, good stewards of the environment and uh, clean up or at least re, uh, reduce the effects of our legacy releases without you know, bankrupting ourselves over the next few decades here. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll give my easy answer first. As a project manager, my job is to implement the remedy selected by EPA. So that's groundwater pump and treat. <laughs> <laughs> Is it expensive? Yes. Are there other ways? Yes. Can I change the rules? Not necessarily. Um, the approach we took at Livermore site was to negotiate with the, with the regulators in the, in the community. Their concerns were contamination off-site. We built extraction systems to draw the contamination from underneath the residences, pull it back under the, managed, the property managed by the Department of Energy. Uh, build additional internal sites to control contamination so further migration wouldn't happen. I think we're at the point or near the point now where the topic you mentioned is, a, is an important one. The, the additional cost to clean up the source areas, weighing that with the risk that they actually pose to the env environment is an important one. And are there alternative methods? Our focus right now is technology that can actually remove contaminants from the subsurface. Again, that is the emphasis placed on the laboratory and the project by the regulatory and 
and community. Um, but other technologies have been done. You know, there's con other ways to contain or prevent migration. But uh, the question you asked is an important one. It is very expensive. It is very expensive. However, it's also, you saw a lot of the residences that were built up around the laboratory. There are a lot of people that live out there. Although that aquifer isn't used now, in 100 years, maybe it will be needed. So again, what's the, what's the risk? And it's a cost benefit. So um, that's something I think we do need to work, for, work towards and be cognizant of. My question is more of a housewife kind of question. Uh, we, most of us don't trust these labs because of the things that have happened for many, many years. Mm -hmm. um, the pastor of the church that I used to go to who recently died used to demonstrate there constantly, um, Bill O'Donnell. Anyway, um, I was wondering what if um, you changed your framework just amongst yourselves, and you decided that maybe you were going to try to recycle the water on your site, and you would use it for your coffee pots and your drinking fountains and your showers and watering your garden on site. Would that be possible? That's actually, that's something we're doing right now. One of our facilities, uh, TFD, which is one of our fixed facilities, um, just last month, we've hooked that up to our irrigation system, and we're using the treated effluent for on-site irrigation. And they're looking at plans to do that elsewhere on the site. This has been, we've looked at this before. It's been a problem in the past just because of the mineral content of the water. It's high in sodium, and the plants don't necessarily like a very salt rich water, but, but, but we I are would, using it. I would like you to drink it too. And if you, you did, then I think it would stimulate Livermore, I, all of you to do a much. Livermore Springs Water Company, I'm ready to retire. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> well, I, I just think that, you know, it's. There's plenty of people getting hired to do this cleanup, but if, if you had to drink it, maybe you guys would come up with some other ideas faster. <laughs> maybe. I'd like to know uh, how close the site is to a fault. Um, there's a Las, there's a, I have a slide on that. There is a Las Positas fault that runs um, to, through the southeast, adjacent to the southeast corner of the site. Um, it's not a major fault, I haven't, you know. But it's moved, hasn't it? Uh, it, it creeps, I believe. I don't, I don't think there's been a lot of Well, there there. have been significant uh, incidences of earthquakes out there. Uh, I remember about 10 years ago when the people there, many of them would have died if they hadn't just had a, an emergency drill so that they wouldn't be sitting at their desks in front of these very heavy bookcases in an earthquake. Mm. And the bookcases came down on the desks. Um, the other thing is, uh, how close is it to any sort of uh, creek? Well, we have the two arroyos. The Arroyo Seco, which flows through the southeast portion of the site, and Arroyo Las Positas, which is along the northern boundary. Have you been testing yes. these arroyos? Yes, we, as part of our uh, permits to operate the facilities, we have to treat, we have to analyze not only the effluent from each facility, but also the receiving waters, which are the stream channels. And um, we're, you know, we do not, it, it's clean going out, it's clean into the, uh, into the arroyos. Now, one thing I will mention that that is the circle cleanup. There is also monitoring for the ongoing operations of the laboratory, and they do additional monitoring outside of the circle cleanup, where they monitor sewer, air, and water. Mm -hmm. How does the, um, I think it's that group out there, Livermore Cares, mm -hmm. uh, how Try did they care. feel about your, pro uh, your efforts? Well, we have a very good relationship with Tri Valley Cares. Mm -hmm. uh, we meet with them on, uh, I'd say at least a couple times a year. Mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, it's an interesting relationship, but in general, it's a productive one. Yeah, um, I don't know a whole lot about groundwater, so I had a quick question about um, some of the slides that you showed. You had um, 
the plumes that how they evolved over time, showing less concentration in the you know the next um, over time. But it's mo it moves and it moves and it doesn't just shrink; it actually evolves. So is that just the normal way that groundwater moves? Are you, I'm sorry, you're I talking mean, about the animated the, movie. No, you had like two slides. You had like the not before and after, but like one year and then a few years later, yes. and it showed like less concentration. Yes. Um, so, so it it really moved, and I'm just wondering: is is it just if you hadn't done anything, it would have been moving as well, just in the same way? So the purpose of those slides because it's definitely less concentrated. Yes, but it, and that you was know, that it, was try to to try to de demonstrate the effectiveness of our groundwater systems. So if we hadn't done anything, the plumes would not change. Probably would have gotten a little bit larger. But because we are pumping the groundwater out and treating it, we're removing the contaminated groundwater from the systems. Therefore, the concentrations, basically the plumes contract. Well, it doesn't just contract. It seems to be moving. Um, it seems to, to kind of just move. I mean, you do, obviously, yeah, you have less concentration. That right. was really obvious from your slide. Right. But it was also moving. Yeah. So, I mean, you And have not necessarily shrinking. You know, in some areas, it would shrink. In mm -hmm. other areas, mm -hmm. it would just... Yeah, so you have variability at any time you go out there, you're going to have variability in concentration. But, um, you know, in general, the plumes do not move oh. wildly. I mean, it's not okay. like if we shut down the systems, it would be 100 feet off site. I mean, it's, it's fairly slow migration. Okay, so maybe it was like the question of scale or something or? Yeah. Hey, Pete, I'm Scott with Tri-Valley Cares, actually. Um, and one question I had was that there's been some problems with the leading edge of the plume, and you could see in your models that it was kind of an island mm -hmm. out there. And just for kind of a learning purpose, I'm wondering if earlier on in the cleanup process, something could have been done differently to have prevented that island situation from happening, for example, putting pumps farther out or and also what the plan is. I know it's kind of up in the air still mm -hmm. for dealing with that um, leading edge of the plume. So, uh, yeah, so we have basically what you've seen. Maybe I, could, maybe I can pull that up. All right, so try to hold the laser here and see if this will work. So you'll see this is HSU2, which is the HSU, the contamination you're talking about. And so here's the leading edge. So think about this area of the map while you watch this. Oops. I have to use this. This is based on data, yes, monitoring data. OK, and then you'll see, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not used to this mouse. You'll see these uh, red dots appear here. Okay, so you'll basically see that is being held in place. That, that island that you called it is being held in place. And if you watch that one more time, you'll see near the end there's a red triangle that shows up in that plume. And that's actually in 2007, for the year 2007, we actually operated extraction from that well to see the effectiveness. But here it comes, there it goes. And you see it did have a little bit of an effect there. So basically where we are is this, these are the wells along our offsite pipeline. Groundwater is extracted and pumped back and treated on site and discharged. This portion of the plume hasn't moved, but it hasn't, but you say it's become an island. Basically we've, we've effectively cleaned up the area between the main body of the plume and, and this little island, like you said, this little nod, knob. Um, we did that test in 2007 to see what would happen. Basically, um, hydraulically, when you, if you think back, I'll try to draw this with a laser if you can, you remember that cone of depression, right? You, you're, you're drawing down the water table. So what you're doing is you're, you're pulling groundwater back here and it's basically flattened out here and created a stagnation zone where it's not moving towards the wells but it's not moving away either, all right? So um, we just recently have gone through this I mean, we've had these discussions, and um, we have settled on an agreement with the EPA that we will extend, well, our proposal is to extend the pipeline out into that location where we already have power, attach it, 
pump groundwater and bring it back on site and treat it. Does that answer your question? It, it does, but I was wondering just if how that could have been done earlier or how the situation could have been prevented just for future. Um, you know, it's sort of like hindsight is twenty twenty. Mm -hmm. At the time that this was constructed, um, the, the thinking was that that would be pulled back and those, that contamination would be captured by the down lead, down gradient wells. It didn't fully capture it. Concentrations have been reduced, but it's basically holding it in place. So it wasn't as effective as designed or as planned, but now we have a plan to move forward and remedy that problem. And I also just wanted to ask if you had any comments about funding difficulties that have happened over the years. And with the cleanup process, I realize that's not your area per se, but oh, I know well, that it's, well, it's affected the process. Um, like project funding? Yes. Yes. So uh, we did have um, a difficult problem in 2008. This is going to get a little bit into the way the government funds its funds the country, if you will, um, and the way DOE operates. So. There are, the Department of Energy, all right, there are, there are, within that there are, I'll just say two components. There's NNSA, which is the National Nuclear Security Administration, which basically runs the laboratory and the other weapons labs within the complex. And then there's environmental management, which funds projects like this. Now the way the, the, the way that the circle process works and the DOE funding works is, E environmental Management, or EM, will fund the characterization and construction of the remedies. And once the construction is complete, the funding uh, onus goes to the operating com uh, component of DOV, otherwise NNSA. So in 2008, Livermore Site had built all its treatment facilities as a, according to negotiations and plans and we were to transition from EM to NNSA. 2008 was, uh, I believe it was an election year. Uh, we have something called a continuing resolution in government funding where basically if there is not a congressional budget in place at the beginning of the fiscal year, which starts on October 1, you projects are allowed to continue because you can't just say October 1, everybody go home, you don't have a paycheck until Congress decides to have a budget. So they say you can, you can continue along assuming you will be funded at the level that you were funded in the previous year, okay? So continued resolutions have gotten longer and longer in recent years. And what happened in 2008 is that we had a continued resolution that went into January. Okay, so we were one third of the way through our fiscal year and we found out in January that, well, there was, there was an OMS bud budget passed, basically it's sort of an 11th hour budget passed. And um, even though we had told, you know, the laboratory and the local offices of DOE had informed Congress that this transition should happen and that every, everyone should know about it. This was sort of like an 11th hour decision trying to get the budget in place. And someone somewhere saw, well, I see zero dollars in EM because it's no longer funded out under EM. And I see what they should get from NNSA and I don't know what is going on so I'm gonna give them half their budget, okay? So we're a third of the way through our year and we're getting 50% of our budget. So that leaves 17% of our budget for the remaining two-thirds of the year. So what, have to, what had to happen at that point is we had to shut down several facilities, we had to release staff from the project, and go back to our priorities as they were originally negotiated, off-site plume control and off-site migration control. Um, later in the year, the money was actually restored so, in essence, the project had never lost any funding. Uh, and, but then we had to go through a period of rebuild. So it had been six to eight months. People had took other jobs. People had been working on the project for years and understood the hydrogeology. So we had to rebuild. So that was 08. 
We're in 2010. Um, all our facilities are operating. We had all our facilities operating as uh, at the end of, by, by September last year. Um, one thing we saw, this gets back to the groundwater plume and how plumes move, we saw that the plumes didn't really change, even though a lot of the facilities had, were, were had to you know, cease operation for some period of time, we didn't really see huge changes in plumes. But we prioritized restart based on locations and went from there. So uh, that's sort of a long-winded, painful part of my life that I had to suffer through. Yeah. Uh, but we made it through and we are back on track. And, um, and hopefully that won't happen again. Well, thank you for that history. And I think it um, illustrates that the funds for cleanup don't come easily. And the lab currently has a $1 billion a year budget to do weapons work. And those funds actually do come fairly easily. And so when you're talking about um, making decisions about doing cleanup and about funding for cleanup, I think that you know, we do have to look at our priorities. Um, and just to mention too, Tri-Valley Cares is generally happy with the way that cleanup has gone and the community is, is satisfied that our groundwater is being protected. So thanks for your presentation, Pete, it's been great. Thank you, Scott. I have two, um, I guess, more sciencey questions. Um, first of all, what happens to the VOCs once they're airstripped? And um, secondly, in terms of the source zone, um, how, if if the technologies that you're testing work, how long do you think it'll, they'll take to effectively get rid of the sources, and and how, how long will it t those technologies have to be implemented for before? You they're no longer contributing towards yeah, that's a, plumes. That's an easy question and a very difficult question. So the easy question, the, the air stripping, uh, it's similar to a soil vapor treatment system where you're volatilizing the contaminants or the VOCs out of the uh, aqueous phase and then those are pushed through an aqueous phase carbon. So it's, it's still carbon, um, but it's just aqueous phase. Yeah, so, so, so the, the VOCs will sorb onto carbon much like your Brita filter, right? It's, so it sorbs onto the carbon and uh, and then the effluent from there is, is clean. And so the carbon is incinerated? Or? The carbon is, uh, man, it's, it's, uh, it's not incinerated, regenerated. regenerated. Also, what happens when you get the VOCs? There are many regeneration technologies, and most of them are related with oxidation, so you can actually convert them to just carbon, chlorine, and nitrogen dioxide. Destructive. In fact, we have destructive technologies, which So the second half is a hard question because uh, a, lot, a lot of the answer is site-specific. Site you can have a technology, but you don't know how effective it'll be based on site-specific conditions. Um, the desire is that it, it greatly accelerates the cleanup. It'd be, I mean, if it's not gonna be any faster than just groundwater extraction, then why do it? Um, I would hope it's on the order of magnitude, but that's just a wild guess. Do I go? Okay. Um, this is coming back to your thematic. Um, I'm with a group called Save Strawberry Canyon, and so just being specific about LBNL here in Berkeley, uh, at this time LBNL has considerable um, in, um, push to expand research up on the hill and concentrate it in this uh, Blackberry Canyon here where the Bevatron has been. Um, and that site is actually a caldera, which is a big bowl of water. And coming to this question of environmental management, I would, and so I guess my question really to you is kind of counsel. Um, how do we get the attention of DOE that um, it's not cost effective to apply uh, research and development up in this area here, which is a tremendously strong 24-7, uh, all during the year, uh, uh, watershed come, of water coming through um, earthquake tracers um, into um, 
year-round water flowing in two and three and four creek, creek flowing creeks all year round. So it just, I don't think LBNL has paid attention. I don't think they've acknowledged the caldera. We know that. They're trying to argue against it, but it's an existing, an existing phenomenon and it's earthquake slide um, uh, land as well. And it's really probably a pretty serious problem for environmental management and cost-effective planning. Uh, well, I'm not that, I don't, I'm not familiar with what you know, the activities you're talking about. Um, this, these, are, these, these are additional laboratory. This is not groundwater or circular cleanup. This is additional facilities you're saying they're additional. considering? But there's also a permit that's just come out, um, just been issued for the Bay Area Water Quality Project to clean up Yeah, that's, I, 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 yeah, I mean. You might talk about it in your coffee hours. Well, <laughs> I, 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 don't, <laughs> I don't have coffee with those kind of people, unfortunately. I mean, <laughs> I'd, I'd be happy to be making the coffee out of the groundwater that I'm treating. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not saying it's not important. It's just, I mean, I would just say you're congressman, but that's, you know, or, or but, but, I mean, I have enough trouble trying to get money for groundwater cleanup, so. <laughs> uh, hi, Pete. Hi. Um, I kind of want to bring you back a little bit to the remediation problem and um, the hydrogeologic perspective. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested in your perspectives from the Site 200 remediation and what I have observed in your, your graphs of uh, PCE and TCE or your plan view maps of um, PC and TCE over time, and that the, as it relates to the leading edge of your plume, has successfully moved back thousands of feet to the east. And in remediation work, we talk a lot about these chlorinated solvents adsorbing onto soil and then diffusing out of the transmissive zones into the low permeability zones, and that serving as an ongoing persistent source for groundwater. And I think the the remediation program with the outside-in approach has been much more effective than other circle sites I have seen. And I was curious if you might be able to give us some commentary on your experiences with the magnitude of this back diffusion problem from fine grain zones and what that may hold for the Livermore cleanup as that uh, strategy is successfully pulling the limits of the impacts backwards and um, any other insights you may okay. have about the media or that process and scale phenomena. Well, I, I pulled up this slide to try to demonstrate what you're describing. So, um, you know, this depicts this migration into the fine grain or sorption onto adjacent fine grain sediment. So it's not just, you know, what you're describing is you can't just put, I'm sorry, I'll just backtrack a little bit. This also gets back to the, to the huge volume of groundwater that we've had to treat. You can't just pump this volume of groundwater and be done. You have to flush through that. So um, it takes several pore volumes to clean up that site. But the fact, the, the thing you're speaking to that we have been able to effectively pull it back. So we haven't seen a lot of this diffusion, back diffusion in the distal portions of the site. And some of that site-specific hydrogeology, fine, you know, fine-grained sediments, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to migrate through the more permeable zones where there are less fine-grained sediment, sediments. Some of it's going to be residence time. The, the less, you know, even though it's been there, it was there 40 years before anybody discovered it, you know, it's, it's residence time, which will limit the amount here. So it's interesting to hear you say that the, our approach is, you, you view that as an effective one because we get flack the other way of saying, why are you doing pump and treat? You should be cleaning up the sources. Um, that's the only way you're gonna clean it up. And our approach was, yes, we agree with that, but we have to contain the problem first. You have to contain the problem, mitigate the problem, do not let it get any worse, get worse, and then focus on it. Since it's gonna take decades, if not a century, to clean up the source areas, 
building out that infrastructure in 10 years or 15 years seemed like a logical way to go. And again, it wasn't just the laboratory saying this is what we're going to do. This was the, the EPA, the State Water Board, the Department of to Toxic Substance Control, and the community. So, uh, you know, insight, it, 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 again, I keep coming back to site specific because if it's a small problem, I think about UST tank. I've got a fuel tank, it leaks, I've got gasoline. The first thing you do is you pull out that tank. The next thing you do is you over excavate the soil. The third thing you do is you get rid of the free product. Then you worry about the plume, right? You want to, because the, the magnitude of the problem is less and the time scale is less. So the sooner you remove that source, the sooner you'll reduce the problem. Um, a situation like this, much different. So, um, you know, I, I will say one of the benefits is that we fairly have a fairly, you know, VOCs are the main problem. We do have a commingled problem with VOCs and tritium, um, but other sites where they have multiple commingled plumes complicate the problem. So, I, you know, it's never easy. The thing that I would say that we've learned is that if you assemble the data and you have the tools to analyze that data and you fully understand your system, then you can, you can develop an effective approach. But if you try to come in and say, this worked here, let's do it here without, with blinders on, that's not, a, that's not the way to go. So. Hi, thank you very much for your very informative presentation. You're welcome. And I wanted to follow up a bit more with what Leslie was uh, talking about regarding Strawberry Canyon and the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Indeed, in 1998, the US EPA did uh, uh, declare LBNL as a Superfund site due basically to the tritium problem. And um, there was... Um, for about 15 years, they did site characterization under RECRA. And the CERCLA issue was basically uh, dealt with administratively. At the, at the beginning of the Bush administration, there was a letter administratively sent indicating that the Lawrence Berkeley Lab will not be included on the national priorities list. We found out, we followed for the last 15 years the characterization of the site. There are huge plumes of VOCs. We have exactly the same chemicals, of course, that you have in Livermore. We have a site which is an old volcano, the collab collapsed caldera of a volcano. Basalt is the Moraga um, volcanics and the basalt associated with that is sort of holding the bowl of the, cr of the crater, and that's where the water is accumulating. But it's accumulating in various levels because, as you know, in the hillside, the elevation change is quite drastic. But basically, in the bowl, we have a lot of water. We have these plumes, and about uh, five years ago, the site characterization ended the RECRA funding ended, there is no site restoration program at Berkeley, and indeed, I believe there is hardly, I think they have maybe one or two pump and treat facilities and maybe one technician that sort of looks after them every once in a while. We have nothing, so in terms of VOCs, they are in the canyon, they are held up in this bowl, they move along the various fault lines in the canyon, the fault lines either are barriers, and we see them from the plume shape, that they, are, they follow the faults, and then they also follow old creek beds, because when the laboratory was um, uh, established, many of the creeks were um, diverted. So there are the old creek beds, and the tritium plume, for instance, is coming straight down an old creek bed and the and reached off site already in 1997 and the way the laboratory dealt with that issue was basically moving the fence line further down the hill because all of the land is owned by UC Regents so they were able to take the fence and move it down 
and uh, say the plume is contained. But we have, we have no cleanup. We have, we have no activities in Berkeley at all at this time. And the issue that Leslie mentioned, the very, very aggressive plan to add more laboratories in the canyon, not only the water is an issue, the landslide, the historic landslides, they are an issue, but then we have these plumes of contamination, VOCs especially, where they are planning to add new laboratories. So what advice would you have for this community <laughs> to get started, you know, where we were sort of in a good spot about 10 years ago when the, when the RECRA program was still functioning, but now there is nothing. So where could we again get started with funding and with cleanup? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, I apologize, but I'm not that knowledgeable about the situation there. And the, the, you said there was, if you, there was a circle project at one point, and you have a you have a treatment facility that's operating. So, I mean, it's it seems to me that there must have been some agreement at some point whether that 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 facility is sufficient and as long as it's operating the risk is mitigated and that was a negotiated ending but i mean that's just me guessing at the situation yeah, there, was no, there was no community buying into any of this it was it was all done very very fast kind of behind the scenes when the funding abruptly the funding was cut and they had to sort of shut everything down mm. you know within within months well i do know i mean if there, if it, if if it is a Superfund site, if it is regulated under CERCLA, there is a no, requirement. It, it was, but you see, it was administratively <coughs> yeah. permitted, not to, to, listed. Right, and then, think, and now it's being operated under RICRA. So. Under RICRA, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think this is something which we are just scientists doing this work, <laughs> and this goes a little bit beyond. This is science and society relationship. So some of the issues which you are raising, how to make DOE respond. It is something that uh, at our level we cannot handle it, I think. And uh, to, from what I understand, somehow in the Livermore area there seems to have established a dialogue between the local community. And so at least in the last 20 years they seem to have been working together in a reasonably eff effective way. But why it is not happening here between the local community and the lab, it goes a little bit beyond our decision making. So I don't think we can. And uh, with that, I'll, I want to simply state that over the last 10 years, in all these colloquia, one of the most interesting parts has been the discussions and the questions and the comments that have ensued after the talk, and I'm sure that all of our speakers have taken back with them as much as they came with. I think they have been given enough of outside perspective which they didn't have. And so to that extent, I'm sure that Peter today has had, not only he gave us quite a bit of very valuable information, but also he's taking back something which he did not have at Livermore, but mm -hmm. he is having in another sister laboratory. And that's a perspective, I think, which is, it'll make him think for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he'll come to LBL and take care of the job, who knows? <laughs> with, that, with that, I think we'll conclude today and we'll, we'll keep you informed as to how this thing progresses. My hope is that this center will remain here as it has always been. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.